uh, it's oh, it's every different ugly color in the world. It's like blue and green and yellow and pink and red and white and. I can't imagine an uglier building. They really, the first thing anybody does when they take over the project is just cover the outside with a different color. Is horse racing dead in the state of New Jersey? I don't know. I hope not because it's a very big industry. Um, you think of all the horse farms, you think of all the people who grow the food for the horses, and you think of all the people with supplies for the horses and the trainers and, and, and all that. And Monmouth Park's beautiful. I love going there. I go like once a year with a group from. Uh, uh, friends and uh, the Meadowlands, I don't go at all, but it's a, another beautiful facility. I hate to see it go away, but you've got to make it work better. You can't keep subsidizing it. And the same thing is true about uh, the whole problem of the casinos, which have suffered a tremendous loss the last quarter. See, I thought they should have. We, we had a lo big effort to do the video lottery terminals in the Meadowlands, and I thought the casinos should have got on board with that because if they're going to lose business in North Jersey, why should it go to Connecticut? Why should it go to Monticello and Yonkers and all those places? Why not go to New Jersey and make them a partner and, and have them get a piece of it? Because they own the casinos anyway that are competing with themselves in Atlantic City. They own Philadelphia. They own things in Delaware. They own things in New York. So why not let them own some things in the Meadowlands? Why not turn the arena, let all the concerts go to Newark, let all the sports go to Newark? Why not turn the arena into a, a mini casino with, with slots and, uh, and with other gambling activities there? and let it save the horse racing and let it help save Atlantic City. Now, Karen Malinowski, who's the dean of equine science at Rutgers, uh, took a trip out to Pennsylvania to take a look at what type of cars, what license plates they had in terms of the new gambling establishments. And she found that half the, half the license plates were the state of New Jersey. Right. Uh, in the parking lot. So they're getting the revenue they're instead of the They're getting the revenue instead of the... And I bet if you went to Mohegan Sun and Mohegan Foxwoods, Sun the you'd, same thing. you'd see a lot. Yeah. And uh, when I was looking at the VLT issue, we traveled to, uh, what is it, not, not, it might have been Monticello. Yeah. Uh, and we also went to other places, but you know, studying the issue, same thing. If the New Jersey residents are going to go there because they're closer, then we lose. If they stay in Jersey in the Meadowlands with VLTs or something, you know, Paul Sarlo wants to do a full-fledged casino, maybe that's the answer, maybe it's not. You could solve everything by taking the arena and making that some sort of facility to generate revenue from gambling and move everything else to Newark and let that facility be 100% successful instead of two places competing eight miles apart, which is another case of madness. You know, what people in the country must be laughing at us for having two arenas less than 10 miles apart that you could probably see both from the Empire State Building. It's crazy. Let's figure a way to help Atlantic City, help the horse racing industry, help the arena problem. Maybe you turn the arena into a little gambling mecca. Should we uh, turn to another issue? Should we take a long, hard look at the, the sort of agricultural bonuses that people have in terms of taxes, that if you own farmland, it's not taxed? And so people have modest farms with magnificent homes on them and nope. claim, they, claim they have the agricultural deduction? I think they had a lot of modest farms. They barely have a farm, you know, and they and they claim a little bit of firewood or they claim, yeah. you know, yeah. I don't know what it is. Uh, Christmas know. trees. Yeah. I think the rule is fine because we should want to save farms, but it should be harder to qualify as a farm because some of the places to do just are ridiculous. It should be real farms. I mean, I think it's tw when I was doing tax returns years ago, it was 1200 bucks. So, yeah, yeah. And that's anybody can, you know, sack sold 1200 bucks worth of firewood, so therefore I have a farm on these 50 acres and of prime real estate with my beautiful home on it, that's a little insane. Raise the, raise the criteria, it would make a lot of sense. Is the world different when you're in Trenton and in Woodbridge? Yeah. Now that you're yeah. mayor? What, what do you say to yeah. yourself? My God, I, I never realized uh, what the towns were facing. No, I, it's more, it's more, well, first of all, I had to stop saying billions and learn to say millions again. <laughs> I went from Woodbridge to Trenton saying millions, and I had to go to billions, now I go back to millions. I didn't realize how tough Trenton was until I left. I mean, we had a good time. I loved the job. It was stressful, but I never realized just how stressful until literally the day I left, and I was sitting in my, my new office the next day, and you said, wow, you know, and people say that, they, that I look better, and, and uh, you know, it just seemed like all the stress of, it, Trenton's a stressful place. Yeah. You know, you've got the, all the political nonsense. You've got reporters following you around, wanting to know who you have lunch with, who comes into your office, who you're talking to. Um, you have to watch everything you say. I mean, I'm before microphones uh, at the Senate and Assembly budget hearings a couple times a year and testifying on other bills. And you got, you know, notebooks all around you with guys with pens and all in front of you is all the microphones and there's cameras everywhere. And you got people on the Senate budget committee trying to take your head off. 
it's a stressful place. You know, going on your 101.5s and your Ninja Ns and doing all the shows and being out there, and one slip up, yeah. and, and you embarrass the governor and you embarrass everybody. So it's a very stressful place. Compared to Trenton, Woodbridge is a, a, is a piece of cake. You know, there's no stress because the job is so much fun and you're helping people and you're out there talking to seniors and Little League parades and Girl Scout cookie sales and all those great things, art shows, concerts. Nothing like it. Nothing like it in the world. What advice did you give the new treasurer? Uh, don't do it. <laughs> but it was too late. I met him after he already accepted. He seems like a pretty good guy. He's got a lot of experience in government. He was on a city council, so that helps a lot. He's a, a finance guy. That helps a lot. Uh, I think he's going to do fine. Um, but he's got to deal with a, you know, 10, like you say, 9, 10, 11 billion dollar budget deficit. He's got a heavy duty learning curve and quick because by March, uh, I don't know, 16th, I think they're doing the budget. That's only six, uh, that's only eight weeks of time to get something together. And it's a tough job, very tough job he's got. Does it really matter what he does? Isn't it going to end up simply being, if you say no to taxes, it's simply going to be cuts? Massive cuts, isn't that the only strategy you're left if with? If you say no new taxes, sure. Yeah. No new revenue sources, sure. It's all going to come from the expense side. There's going to be some growth. The economy is going to get better. They'll pick up a few hundred million in revenues. But yeah, it's going to have to come from the expense side. And that's not going to be easy. Do you ever see McGreevy anymore? No, not really. I mean, I ran into a couple of places, but uh, in five years since uh, he left in August of uh, November of 04, it's been a little over five years, a couple of times, a handful of times I've seen him in passing, uh, not really, don't have a you know direct relationship with him, no. Now he's in a, the seminary in New York now? I think he's actually got a, a church in Hoboken where he's actually oh, he an Episcopalian priest. Yeah, yeah. There's okay. pictures of him and stories about him. About the five-year anniversary, there's a lot of stories in 09 right. about what he was doing, but he's a priest in Hoboken as far as I know. You get tired of people asking you? No, no. I worked for the guy. He was a great mayor, and I still think at the end of the day he's going to have proven to be a really good governor. I mean, he solved DMV. Uh, motor vehicles. He solved car insurance. You know the Highlands Act. He's got. Uh, he took down toll booths. He merged the Parkway and the Turnpike. Car inspections were better. You know his policies and his government actions were pretty solid. You know personal life aside, that's where the problems were. But he got a lot done. He got a lot done as governor. We got a question coming in here. Um, yeah, it's a question. I don't know if uh, Mayor McCormick can answer it or not, but it's about investments that were made in the pension system during the Whitman administration. Someone wants to know if it's true that. A large amount of money was invested in Enron at that time. Uh, yeah, Enron, when we first took office, I think it was Enron, and the question started coming from the media about how much we lost, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, about $118 million we lost in Enron. But um, the problem then was they took a heavy duty bet in high tech. Heavy duty bet in equities and stocks, right. and within that, a heavy bet on high tech. So from 97 to 2000, they rode the wave, and all but said, we are number one, we are number one, and they weren't number one. But if you're number one in good times, you're going to be number 50 in bad times. And the market crashed for high tech, and, it, and we weren't number 50. So that's my point about diversifying. You don't want to be number one, because that means you're, you're probably too heavily You're invested in, that, in what's yeah. doing good, I'd rather float around number 10 to 20 all the time and be able to say, you know, I went from 12 to 18 to 15 to 11 instead of going from 1 to 50 and back. You know, that's, that's not what I think you should do in a portfolio. So your idea of a portfolio management is basically that we ought to really bring in outside people who can help us uh, figure out a strategy and then continue to, to manage and watch what's happening to our interests. Yeah, we brought in consultants to tell us what the asset allocation should be. I think we did 13% to alternatives, right, which right. isn't a lot. It was a start. Real right. estate, ec private equity, hedge funds, uh, venture capital. You gotta, you've got to be in those things if you want to diversify, be diversified. And you can't have great numbers year in and year out if you're not diversified. You go from 1 to 50 if you're not diversified. Should we put those really all in the hands of people who are outside and just maintain some sort of supervision over investments. That's what we did when I was a college. That's the answer. We were, when I was a college president, we essentially put the money in the hands of professionals, and we reviewed it. We had a committee to review it every two months, but uh, that was how we invested our monies. We should be managing the managers, not managing, managing the stocks. Managing. Right. We should let people who know what they're doing, who know real estate, who know private equity. We can still keep some people buying and selling stocks, you know, locally. But with the really technical stuff,